So look, to kick us off, our first uh, speaker today is, is going to be very, very interesting indeed. He has a stellar career in the hospitality industry, some of the top brands in, in hotels all over the world. I noticed also Cunard, which I was very interested in because I had a fabulous Cunard trip last year for a big anniversary and it was absolutely wow. So I'll be asking you more about that later, what it was like working with them behind the scenes. But obviously the hotel industry is changing and our speaker has delved into this and stayed at the cutting edge of what that change actually looks like. And if there's anything we're sure of always, it is that change is coming down the track. So we're going to hear very much about empowering hospitality workers, shifting management styles, and that thing of continuously improving. A little bit every day is what we're aiming for. So will you give a big, big welcome, please, to Tom McDermott. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Cleo, for the uh, invitation to uh, come here today. I really appreciate it. It's uh, great to uh, uh, get in front of, a, of, of, of such a prestigious audience and uh, to share uh, a little bit about uh, what I call collectively as a continuous improvement. And um, I've got a, a, a business outside Dundalk uh, called Agility Hospitality. We specialize in providing uh, training and uh, a, 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 a process optimization services to the hospitality industry um, in particular. Um, but today I'm talking to you about uh, creating an environment for change because as we all know, when there's change impending, when there's change that's been planned, as humans, we don't always like change. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to be able to convince people that it's the right change or, or the right way to go about that change. That's it's just a typical um, human behavior. But I believe that if we've got the right environment for change through adopting a culture of continuous improvement, of creating this environment for change, and we do this every day, then when big changes come along, they won't have such a large impact in our teams and they can bring the teams, we can bring the teams along with us in a much easier way. So this is, this is me. Um, uh, Tom McDermott, I just um, celebrated uh, 36 years in the hospitality business last, last, last week, actually. And uh, I remember my very first uh, exposure um, to hospitality was when I was uh, in school, in our final year of school, our career guidance counselor uh, brought in somebody from CERT. Has anybody been trained by CERT? Probably a few CERT graduates in the room. Um, and they, this lady came along, we were recruiting people for a, uh, a hospitality course in uh, Calabria Street in Dublin. And the line that caught me was, hospitality is the only industry that you can work in, in land, sea, and air, in every country in the world. And I thought, well, it's either that or my father's mushroom business. Then I decided to go and join hospitality. So that's what I did, and 36 years later, um, that's what I chose to do. I live in the Cooley Peninsula, beautiful Cooley Peninsula, but uh, I figured that you know, outside, the outside world is, does exist beyond the Ballymac roundabout. And, uh, and I wanted to experience that, I wanted to explore that a little bit, so hence uh, joining hospitality. I've worked most of my career outside of Ireland, so I worked with some of the, um, the larger brands, and most subsequently with Hilton. I spent 14 years with Hilton, and I uh, was a general manager in Scotland, and then down in London. And then I got asked to join this, uh, what's called the Operational Excellence Program, um, where uh, in 2012, where we conducted lots of uh, process-based process optimization based projects all around the world, in the US and uh, uh, UK and uh, across Europe and the Middle East. So that was, that was the grounding of my kind of background in uh, continuous improvement. So before we get into it, I just want you to just to think about your favorite hotel. Maybe the last time that you've stayed there. Maybe there's somewhere you've been to several times and you're checking out and Something just feels different from this time that you've checked, from the moment you've checked in to now, to the moment you're checking out. Something just feels a little bit different. The people are the same. The facilities are the same. The food in the restaurants are pretty much the same. But something just feels a little bit different. That can be the compound effect of a culture that has been adopted by that business, which is looking for small improvements in every part of the organization every day whether that's the managers, uh, the people who checked you in, the people who made your food, the people who cleaned the rooms. If they're focused on making small improvements all the time, 
you won't even be able, you won't, you won't even be able to put your finger on it, but something feels different. Everything just flows. Less restrictions, less delays, less inconvenience, things just flow as they should be. And that's the power of continuous improvement. Um, that needs to have a culture um, adopted, which I call the bottom-up and leader-led culture, which we're going to have a look at now in a moment. But change is always hard, never easy. And uh, it can be very uncomfortable at the start. It can be messy in the middle, but a change executed well can have amazing results, and people can feel an awful lot better about it after, afterwards, and things are an awful lot easier, streamlined, simpler, making things easier for the team is the first priority. Just to demonstrate that, you just want to fold your arms for a moment. Just fold your arms, how it's comfortable, how it feels. And I've got my right hand above my left arm here. And now try to do that the other way around, where your right arm is over your left hand. How does that feel? Weird, yeah. Yeah, it's very uncomfortable. It doesn't feel nice. But that's change. Now, there's nothing physically stopping us from folding our arms in the other way. With a better practice, we can do it. And maybe when you, if you persevere with it, you might even like the way you fold your arms in a different way. But it's not a natural feeling. It feels a little bit different. I start most of my training and talks with this slide here. Because very often, we're the person at the front here. We're the person working really, really hard. We're the caveman pulling the rocks, and we don't really know it, we, but we've got square wheels on our rock truck. And we've always done it that way, so we don't know any different. We're just focused on what's in front of us. We're doing what we always done. And sometimes, somebody comes along with a solution to that problem. They've got the solution of the round wheels. And we're so accustomed to doing things the way we've always done it, we just say, no thanks, no, you're grand, no problem. We just continue doing what we're doing. We don't have time. We don't want to listen to another way of doing things because we're quite happy with the status quo, quite happy with the convention, quite happy the way we do things. We're quite happy with our brand standards. We're quite happy with our services. We're quite happy with the way we run our operation. And you know, we don't really need to change. Everything is, everything is grand, so thanks very much. But sometimes this person that's coming along with the round wheels, the new technology, a new idea could be the person that's not necessarily sitting beside you here today who has lots of experience, but it could be the person who's brand new, who just started in your hotel, restaurant, bar, uh, in your business. It could be somebody who's been there, who, who hasn't been there very long, but they've got a fresh pair of eyes. They can look at things in a totally objective and unemotional way and identify areas of your business or areas of your processes where with a small change can make a massive difference and make things an awful lot easier than they have been. But if we're not receptive to that change, if we, don't, if we don't leave ourselves open, if we're not humble enough to know and to believe that we can do things differently, we could be missing out on a lot of opportunity. This is a historic picture here, looking back in how things used to be in our business. And this is an era where people didn't have this culture of improvement. This was a very much a command and control kind of environment. The way things used to work maybe 80, 100 years ago. And people did what they were told. Um, they were told to do things in a certain way, and they went along and did it in a certain way. Um, they didn't, weren't asked for their opinions. And in fact, if they did suggest something, perhaps they were ridiculed for it. Perhaps there wasn't um, a, 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 a positive reception when they would suggest to do things a little bit differently. And the theme back then, or the focus, was very much, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let's just continue to do things the way we've always done them. Let's just continue to have this hierarchy in place where when somebody moves from wearing the waistcoat to wearing the jacket, all of a sudden, they seem to know everything. They don't, uh, they don't know that there might be other ways of doing things. They're not exactly doing the job themselves every day, but because they've got this experience, they think this is the way that everything should be done and I know the best way. And that's certainly not the way that we run our businesses today or the way we shouldn't run our businesses today. Things are moving an awful lot faster. Um, change is inevitable. We've got 
a huge amount of change both in the technology business but in the service industry and manufacturing and transport and communications and every other sector of course and our skills are not necessarily keeping up with this change we need to look at things perhaps in a different way you know what used to be the case where we would have uh, everything very very manual um, everything uh, uh, done um, uh, uh, by, the, by the person on reception or by the, by the waiters in the restaurant, taking orders, checking people in, all this sort of stuff um, can be automated now. We've moved along an awful lot. The availability of technology, of, e of information, is at the fingertips of everybody. So we have to be able to respond to those changes because our team are different. Our team are much more educated than they ever have been. Um, they've got different needs and, 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 and wants from what we had when we started, in my case, 36 years ago. Um, people want to have more of a say in the work that they're doing. They want to be consulted more. They want to be involved in the design of the work that they're doing. They want to have more flexibility in the kind of work that they do or the schedules that they work. People want to have more time for their family, for their hobbies, for their pastimes, for their interests. They don't respond well to this top-down, this is the way you do it, there's no other way, and they want to have a say, they want to contribute to be able to do things a little bit differently. Flexibility is a key word where it comes to today's uh, hospitality uh, workers. Some people want to have a career in our sector. Some people want to go straight from school into catering college and spend the next 40, 50 years in hospitality. But most don't. Most want to have maybe a couple of years here while they're going through universities or perhaps to do this for a period of time while they're traveling or perhaps they want to get to a certain stage and then they see there's other opportunities elsewhere and that's okay. The good thing about our industry is 24 hour a day, seven day a week business, 365 days of the year, we need all these kinds of people. We can use them all whether they want to work one or two days a week or whether they want to have a career um, within the industry. So our team are very different than they once were. Let me introduce you to a model called the Kano model. And this Kano model is used sometimes for product development of understanding what it is that customers want for a new product um, that's, that's been designed. But we can also use it where it comes to analyzing what's of value to customers, where it comes to uh, 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 the satisfaction customers have with a particular product or a service, or uh, the degree of implementation of features of that product. And uh, within, this, within this model, you've got these three lines here. You've got baseline expectations, you've got linear satisfiers, and then you've got delighters. And delighters are the things that are kind of unexpected. The little gestures, the little extras that uh, you, you, you receive as a, as, as a customer or you experience that just put the experience on a totally new level. The linear satisfiers are the things that you come to expect, you take for granted. Um, you're going to have a certain level of service or you're going to have a certain uh, 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 level of, uh, of, of features within a certain product. And then you have the baseline expectations, which are the must-haves. These are the absolute fundamentals of things that you absolutely have to have, otherwise the product or the service will be completely irrelevant. Can anybody remember their first car they ever had? What was it? A Seat? What you said? A Fiat. A Golf. I remember my, my first car very well. Um, and it was one like this. It was a 1981 Toyota Starlet in beige. And I was delighted with it. Uh, I was, uh, I think I was 18, something like that. I was working in Dublin at the time. And I thought, this is fantastic. You know, this is, this is great. I've got my own transport, got my own car. I didn't care it was beige. Um, you know, my friends thought it was hilarious, but uh, I didn't care it was beige. Um, this car had uh, very, very basic technology in it. Um, it had, you know, one of these things. Remember these things? You used to put the windows up and down. Like, uh, you know, th those were quite normal. Now, some of the people in the room wouldn't know that at one stage, you used to have to wind the handle to put the windows up and down, all right? But <laughs> back then, you did. When you were leaving the car, when you were locking it, you had to go around and push down all the buttons on the doors. Do you remember that? 
you didn't have like one of these things in your hand where you just uh, opened all the doors or you closed all the doors instantly. So, so, so it's developed an awful lot. It's changed an awful lot. Um, this car had four gears, four, right? First to fourth and your reverse gear. It didn't have fifth until a couple of years later. Um, no such thing as air conditioning. Air conditioning in Ireland. Um, why would you want a car with air conditioning in Ireland? What benefit is there in cruise control? The, the, the roads, you'd be, you'd be taking your life in your hands if you go above 60 miles an hour. Um, so there's a lot of things um, which back then, I suppose, were fine, um, and I was happy with it. it was a, I, I was kind of was meeting my expectations at the time. I was quite delighted. My first car, I was excited about it. Um, but over time, if that car um, and that company didn't increase the services, the features that they had in the car, then, you know, I would, I would soon find that the things that delighted me at one stage, like if I was given the, that car then with a cruise control on it, or even a radio, even a radio with a, with a, with a, with a tape deck in it, didn't even have one of those, um, I would have been delighted, but it didn't. So over a period of time, what we take for granted as, uh, as the norm, as, a, as maybe a, as a delighter even, you go to a hotel room and you've got, um, uh, uh, you've got your direct dial telephones, all right? Great feature at one stage. Um, then we've got air conditioning. We've got straight to room technology where you don't even have to go past a desk. You've got it all on your phone. Um, you've got streaming services to go straight onto your TV. You can have the temperature of the room set to your exact requirements before you even arrive at the hotel. All this sort of stuff are delighting um, our guests for now. But over a period of time, they're going to become linear satisfiers. Things we come to expect anyway. And then over a further period of time, they're going to become baseline expectations. We won't be excited by them anymore. They're going to be just what everybody else is doing them. They're going to be the fundamentals of what we do, what we come to expect. So standing still is actually going backwards. If we don't continue to innovate and, and improve the processes and the products and the services that we offer, we're not, just, we're not just standing still, we're going backwards because our competitors are going to soon overtake us and then they will set the norm. They will include the delighters that maybe we're missing out on. Maybe you don't remember, but at one stage, we used to have keys made of metal going into bedrooms in hotels. It's hard to believe now, but still, there's some of them around now, but they were made of metal. Um, they weren't made of plastic, as we come to expect now. So if we never, if we never continue to in innovate and to move along, we'd still be ha using keys made of metal. So we've got to think differently. We can't solve our problems. We can't keep up with our uh, competitors, with our industry, with our sector, um, by having the same thinking that we used when we created um, these problems. We've added a lot of complexity into our processes and our business and the services that we offer. And we need to think differently, perhaps, about how we go about addressing some of those, uh, some of those, some of those friction points um, by simplifying processes. I've got a four-stage approach that I use for continuous improvement. And in this approach, we put it the very, very first priority is making the job easier for team members. If we can make the job easier for the team, first of all, we get their buy-in because Everybody wants to have an easier, easier work. They don't want to have uh, uh, difficulties and complexity in, the, in their everyday work. Nobody wants to have that. Um, and we do that by taking things away, by streamlining the processes, by identifying what is adding value to the customer and what's not. How can we take away some of the things that don't add any value to the customer? Because when we can do that, we can save time. And when we save time, it allows us to add more value to the guest experience. Whether that's on check-in, or in the restaurant, or in the bedrooms, or, or whatever part of the, of the business it is, if we can identify capacity in the workday that we are able to then add more value to customers, to be able to give them more of the, of the service, of the interaction um, that they really want, and that our staff, frankly, want to deliver, then that's the second priority. We have to do this through a culture, embedding this culture of continuous improvement. And I call this the bottom-up and leader-led approach, where the leaders create the compass heading. This is the direction we want to go in, but the detail of how to get there 
I believe should be designed and put into place by the team. The people who do the work are the people who know where the opportunities for improvement are. But very often, we don't ask. We don't consult with them. We don't ask them to design a new bedroom cleaning process. We don't ask them to lay out the bar in a certain way to make things easier. We don't always consult with them to ask them these questions. And then, and only then, when these first three stages are in place, it's when we can start to get see business benefits, improve productivity, profitability, competitiveness, all this other good stuff that we want to be known for, business benefits that we want to see, I don't believe they're going to happen unless we put those first three stages into place. Starting with the team member of making the job easier for them. In every process, in every department, in every hotel, in everybody's daily life, there is different parts of the day that we're working on things that add value to our customer experience. There's also times of the day where we're doing activities that don't add any value. And then we have these bits in the middle which are maybe adding value to the business but don't necessarily add value to the customer. So let me, let me, let me explain. So in the green here, we've got value-adding activities. In the and they are things that customers are willing to pay for. So that's for the, uh, the fantastic welcome on arrival, the beautiful room, fantastic dinner, the cocktails in the bar, all the sort of stuff that people see value in. And in the red, we've got activities where the customer doesn't see any value. This could be queuing up at reception. It could be waiting for the bartender to find the correct glass before they go along and uh, make the cocktail. Um, no value to the team member, to the guest, to the business, to anybody. If we were to stop doing those red items, nobody would notice, nobody would care, because they're not adding any value to anybody. And in the middle, we have some of these other activities which are necessary for the business, but don't add any value uh, to, the, to the customer experience, such as a good example is cashing up at the end of the night. You know, we're counting out our money and balancing our credit cards uh, machine with our point of sale system and all this kind of stuff. The customer doesn't care. It's not adding any value to their experience, but it's necessary for the business to do that. But can we streamline that process? Can we make that simpler? Can we integrate it? Can we automate it? Um, can we make it uh, less time be consumed doing that? Because if you can get rid of the red items completely, because nobody cares, nobody wants them, and if you can reduce the yellow items, the portion of the day that's spent on the green value-adding activities automatically increases. There's more time in the day to spend in activities that the customer is willing to pay for. But this takes a change in mindset where it comes to customer value. We need to think in our heads that customers are only interested in paying for value-adding activities. The customer only wants to pay for the green stuff. So if we've got a huge portion of red and orange activities in the day, that's not what the customer is willing to pay for. So if you treat everything that's not green in this case as waste, we can either remove it or we can streamline it, we can reduce it, we can make it less time spent doing that. There's lots of different models to help us to manage change. And uh, one that I really like is Cotter's uh, eight-step uh, model of change. And this is one that's been uh, around for quite a while. Um, very, very successful model, and I quite like it. Um, it's got three main stages to it. There's creating the climate for change, letting everybody know there's an urgency um, of why we need to change, getting the, the leaders on the one page of what's the requirement, why do we need to change, um, uh, uh, and what the vision is for that change. Then there's the engaging and enabling of the organization, the communicating with the teams getting quick wins. Quick wins build momentum. If we can make small improvements, they lead on to bigger improvements over a period of time. We need to get those quick wins fast to start generating improvements. And then when we do that, we get implementing, we, we get to the implementing and uh, sustaining the change part of the process. So we get momentum building and then we start to embed that in the culture of the organization. Changing a culture of an organization takes a long time. It's not measured in months, it's measured in years. To get from stage one to stage eight here could take 18 months, two years, 10 years. Depends on the organization. It's a long process. And when the, when the, when the goal is so, so large or so far away, people can sometimes lose interest. What I prefer 
is to first establish this bottom-up and leader-led culture. And I mentioned it a little bit before, but the leader-led culture is about the leaders creating this positive environment for change, where they are receptive to doing things differently, listening to ideas from the team, um, actively asking questions of what is the best way um, to complete this process. What is the best way uh, to, to be able to serve, serve this customer? What are we doing now that can be improved next week? What can we do in the few, next week that's going to make uh, our performance even better? What are the small things that we can do? And remember, in the priority of making the job easier for the team. The bottom up part is the team being given responsibility to improve process. It's one thing being asking them what they think and then maybe doing something with the information or even worse, doing nothing with it. But if you give the team responsibility for improving processes, that's building engagement, that's building motivation with your team. I once had a, had a housekeeper um, if, uh, last year and um, she had a problem where the room attendants all wanted to have personalized trolleys. Um, their own trolley that they looked after, um, and they weren't happy then when they come back on their days off because they left it all nice, and then when they come back on their days off, then somebody had set it up in a different way, and they had to rearrange everything when they came back. So the solution then was uh, the housekeeper took everybody into a room with an empty trolley, all the equipment that had to go on the trolley, and said, okay, now you decide how you want the trolleys to be set up. You can have your personalized trolleys, but they have to be standardized, they have to be set up exactly the same way, but you decide how you want to do it. That's what has to go on there. I don't care how you lay it out, but that's how it's to be, how you decide how it's to be done. And they did. It took them an hour. Um, housekeeper came back, and uh, there was still a couple of arguments. Said, well, look, everybody has to agree to this. So another half hour later, everybody finally agreed. And the consistency afterwards of having those trolleys set up in that way every single day solved that issue. Then collaboration. Resolving customer-driven projects together. The, 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 the team don't always have the authority, they don't always have the, uh, the influence to be able to make um, changes or to change things. So th there's a collaboration needed um, with the leaders where it comes to resources or where it comes to clearing the path to make things easier. There will be, there will be stumbling blocks, there will be uh, barriers in the way, and the leader um, can, can help to remove those, those uh, uh, stumbling blocks to help maintain progress on the project. There's a very interesting book um, called uh, The Lean Turnaround, and it's written by this guy, um, Art Byrne. Now, it is set in a manufacturing sector uh, in, the, in the US, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manufacturing by a large um, company. Um, but he's done quite a lot of these turnarounds over, over the years, this, this, this particular um, gentleman. And uh, he's had some great um, takeaways that can be applied in any industry sector of what's made these changes successful. And the first step in that, he believes, is that it must be led by the leader of the business. The person in charge of the organization needs to make sure everybody knows that it's important to them to lead through this change. And if it's important to your boss, it should fascinate you. And it should be really important for the team to get behind the leader. He also makes an interesting point that just mere obedience doesn't change a culture. You can tell people to adopt this new culture of doing these different things, but telling them won't generate any change, any meaningful change and change the culture. Focus on changing the process is not the results. So looking at uh, the, uh, uh, the ultimate goal and the ultimate, the ultimate result can sometimes seem very, very far away, and you have to break it down into smaller steps, smaller changes to become more successful and become ingrained. The best ideas come from the people doing the work. You know, as we said, the people doing the, uh, 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 in, the, in the bar or the restaurant or the kitchen, they know where the opportunities for improvement are. The managers, the leaders, the general managers don't know. They can't possibly know where those opportunities for improvement are going to be. And then develop and broaden the skills of the workshop, of the workforce is fundamental. If you give people more skills, they've got more opportunity for spotting more opportunities uh, for improvement. This is about building small changes over a period of time. And um, sometimes when you ask people, um, what would you rather have? Would you rather have three million euros now or a penny, but the penny doubles in value every day for a month? What would you choose? The three million quid or the penny? 
Who's, who's going who's gonna to go with the 3 million euros? Who's going to go with the penny? Who doesn't have a clue? <laughs> so the 3 million euros sounds great, right? But, you know, there's something, the, 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 the penny sounds intriguing. So, um, so, so taking a penny and doubling it in value every day uh, for, for a month, it could take a long time to see the benefits of how that penny can accumulate in value over a period of time. Um, but when you take the penny, you double it in value, um, it doesn't make any difference for the first uh, 29 days or so. But then on day 30, the penny suddenly generates a lot more um, uh, revenue than the, uh, than the 3 million euros will. So after 30 days, the penny doubling in value is worth 5.3 million euros. After, if you chose a 31-day month for your experiment, um, you get 10.7 million euros. So one penny can generate that momentum over a period of time. That's the compounding effect. It's about making these small improvements over a period of time. It's a bit, it takes a long time to get momentum, to get things going, but when you do, it really starts to build um, momentum. I don't know if anybody ever read this book here, um, Atomic Habits. It's been around for a little while. Fascinating book about changing habits. You, 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 you recognize that? Absolutely fantastic book. Really, really recommended. Uh, written by this gentleman called James Clear. And James Clear, is, 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 uh, his whole uh, perspective is based on the power of tiny gains, of looking at very, very small 1% improvements that can be made consistently over a period of time to generate big results. It's not about focusing on the great big project or the big improvement or the big change we're going to do. It's about just doing the small stuff consistently uh, over a period of time and generating that momentum. When you start with one, if you do a 1% improvement every day for a year, the one becomes over 37 um, over that period of time. So it's like a 3,600% increase. But the interesting thing is, even though uh, if you were to take 1%, do 1% um, less um, during that period of time, you lose 97%. So your one then becomes 0 0.03. Um, so it just goes to show that you might make some gains over the period of the year. If you've got some backward steps, sometimes you go two steps forward, one steps back, it's not the end of the world because what you lose is far outweighed than the gains you have of adopting this 1% improvement over a period of time. Another person who's adopted this 1% approach um, is uh, Sir Dave Brailsford. And you might have heard of, of him where it comes to, he coined the phrase marginal gains. And uh, where it came to British cycling and uh, the sky racing, racing team, as you can see here, um, he said marginal gains are a method of reaching high performance levels through constantly making small and incremental improvements. Little things being done consistently over a period of time. This had massive success for uh, British Cycling. Uh, uh, British Cycling had only won, I think it was one Olympic medal since the 1930s until he came along, between 1930s and 2007. And then from 2007 to 2017, um, they won 178 world championships in track and road cycling. Um, they won 66 uh, Olympic and Paralympic gold medals, five Tour de France victories that never won one before. Ireland had won two in that period of time. Um, they set seven world records, nine Olympic records in the 2012 Olympic Games in London. That was all true 1% improvements, small improvements that were made on a consistent basis. So there is some, some basis for this approach of just making these small changes. The people who are doing the job or the work know where those small little improvements can be. Asking, what are you going to do differently in the next week that you're not doing today? This lady here, uh, Dr. Uh, Amabel, Teresa Amabel, she uh, uh, wrote this uh, book called The Progress Principle. And this was fascinating for me, um, where people, the biggest motivator she found of teams is the feeling of making progress. More so than stats and uh, 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 physical achievements, it was that feeling that they have, that they're going somewhere, that they're making progress. Dave Brailsford talks about this. James Clear talks about this. It's about making these small improvements that gives people a feeling as opposed to just looking at um, um, the stats and the numbers. When people have a sense that they're improving, the amount of the improvement doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how, how large it is. A small improvement is good. Uh, people can build on small improvements. Um, the power of progress is more about feelings and emotions than facts or stats. And small wins matter more as they're more likely to occur 
than big wins. So we focus on the small stuff. It generates that feeling rather than focusing on the bigger stuff that takes longer for people um, to, uh, uh, to get on board with, and sometimes they give up before they get to the end goal. She's got four, uh, four, four, four things that leaders can do to help improve the uh, feeling of progress among the team. And the first one is creating meaning, that people need to have a meaning or a focus on the work that they're doing. They want to know why they're doing that work. What's the reason? What's motivating them? Setting clear and actionable goals, but focusing on the small wins. We've got a goal to get here, but let's break it down into what are the one or two things that you can do uh, in the next week that's going to move us forward. Um, providing autonomy, giving people the goal, giving them the target, and then getting out of the way, letting them try stuff. People learn an awful lot more from the failures they have than they do from the successes they have. If you're making small improvements, the failures are going to be small too. So it's not going to break stuff. Um, so when they go through a process then to try and analyze, well, what went wrong, their problem-solving skills improve as well. So it's win-win, even if they uh, fail at the first attempt. Removing friction. So leaders should uh, proactively remove obstacles uh, from, from the process. It's about clearing the path, whether that's resources, whether it's manpower, whether it's just influencing other people that's going to allow progress to continue. The leaders have to have the power to be able to do that. The team members don't always. And then broadcasting progress, making sure that people are recognized for the work that they've done, for the achievements they've made, the, the journey they've been on so far, and publicly recognizing uh, those, uh, that, that success that it's getting us closer towards the goal. Now, this is all fine in theory. And then you go and you speak to your hotel teams, and you think, well, sometimes you have these responses. Well, we've always done it that way. Or that's the way I was trained how to do it. Or that's the way we do things around here. Oh, this chestnut here, we're too busy, we don't have time. Are these familiar responses that you get when you start to suggest change, you suggest doing things a little bit differently? You get this folded arms, no, 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 we tried that 15 years ago, never worked, you know. Uh, don't really want to try it again. Um, so, so we have to get around that. And the way I suggest that we get around that is not by constantly asking people for new ideas, but asking them, what are some of the things that bug them? What are some of the things that they're doing as, they're in, as part of their work in the processes that they're, do, that they're doing every single day that just frankly get on our nerves? And they know they're not adding any value. They know it's just a waste of time. But they don't always verbalize that. They don't always tell you about it. What I recommend as an activity is to do this exercise. I'm going to show you a little video for a moment. It'll explain the concept of, uh, of this fix what bugs you. And it's about identifying the things that just get on your nerves, which then, when you invert those, become improvement ideas. The video I'm going to show you is from a company called Seating Matters. They're in Limavady in Northern Ireland. And uh, Seating Matters are a uh, company who was eight years ago were about to go out of business, weren't doing very well. They found lean, continuous improvement, 1% gains, um, and they started implementing it in their business. And slowly over a period of time, um, they, they generated huge improvements to such a degree that people come from all over the world to see what they've done in their facility called Seating Matters in uh, Limavady. They've just had the global um, uh, two-second lean conference um, in, in, uh, in Limavady there a couple of months ago. So they're, they're a world leader where it comes to this. So let me show you the video. Um, we'll see what you think, and we'll have a chat about it then after. Hello, it's Ryan Tierney here from Lean Made Simple, and I'm really excited to share another really good lean concept. So the concept we're going to talk about today is fix what bugs you. And this is a concept that I came across eight years ago when I came across the book Two Second Lean by Paul Akers. And this concept changed my way of thinking forever. So one of the reasons we've been so successful at the implementation of Lean is that we keep things really simple. We use simple concepts that every single person in the company can get behind and understand. So must Donna here at the cutting department. Okay, Donna, you've done a fix with Bugsy improvement. This here really bugged me, Ryan. This is my water bottle that was lying over everywhere when I pulled this out, it was falling down. Yeah. So it fixed what bugged me and I put a wee folder in there for it. Simple. 
Thank you. Look, so something that really bugged me in the morning time when I was bringing in my laptop, I didn't know where to set it. So I was putting it down and the cables weren't reaching. So now when I come in, I have these little L markers that I put it down exactly where I need it and I can use that throughout the day. Fix them what bugs me. Thank you. So just notice Ben under his desk here. What are you working on, Ben? Hey Ryan, so whenever I was sitting down there, the cables were getting caught in my feet, so I decided to tie them up here now and it looks a lot better as well and they don't get caught in my feet anymore. Hey Ryan, so this is a thing that bugged me here. So once uh, I had my laptop set up, I had loads of cables and two screens, ethernet cable, uh, keyboard and mouse to plug in. So now I've got this docking station that one cable just plugs in so I'm ready to go straight away. Hi Ryan, um, I just fixed up these cables here. They were always hanging down in below the table. Yeah. Um, and they're two different chargers for my phone, so I've just put them on wee magnets here. So they're always sitting neat and tidy and I know where to go to get them. So just fix them up, bugs me. Okay Colin, so what does fix what bugs you mean to you? I Fix what bugs you is a really powerful idea. It's great for inspiring improvements. If you ask somebody, think of an improvement, uh, it can be difficult just to think of one on the spot, but if you ask somebody, what bugs you, what bothers you, uh, it doesn't take long for people to think of something, and then you're straight into an improvement opportunity. So it's great at generating improvement ideas. Massive fix what bugs me improvement here for in the, the welding area is these jigs. So our bays are pretty confined. Uh, so when we pull a big jig like this in, you're welding, and then you have to walk around the jig and weld it again and walk around it again. So we've come up with this class solution now. Just this wee handbrake on the side here, I have a bit of fast pipe. You push it down, and we've had the bearing in the bottom now, so the jig spins. So it means when we're welding now, we can turn the jig to us to wherever we need to weld it. That's exactly where it is. Hello Beverly, you've just showed me a really quick fix what bugs you improvement. This here, Ryan, this light kept coming down and hitting me in the hand. I put a wee bit of elastic around it, and it's perfect. Great job. So every single week we do lean tours where people travel from all over the world to come and experience our lean culture. But every single week we improve the experience so that the tour the next week is even better. So another really good example of fix what bugs us. So this is the lanyard we use for lean tours. We just had the first name on there first of all. Then we improved it again because it really bugged us because several companies come on a tour on the same day. And we weren't clear on what person was with what company so we improved it again. Then on a tour last week, somebody asked, what's the Wi-Fi password? So we put the answer on there as well. So every time something bugs us, we stop and we fix it there and then. It's really a powerful concept. Thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope this video has inspired you to fix what bugs you. So even though that's in a manufacturing setting, I'm sure you can see the benefits of asking the team to come up with the small improvements that, that a manager would never, would never see, would never know that this is, that this is a, an, an improvement that impacts the, uh, the team member. Um, like that lady with the light hit, coming in and hit her in the hand, there's not a manager in the world who would know that, that was an issue. It's distracting her, it's causing her, um, uh, um, even, even just the, their mind being distracted by something like that, but they have the power to fix it. So these small improvements uh, uh, improve over time and, and compound over time. Um, this gentleman here, Mr. Mr. Deming, he's one of the, the forefathers of, uh, of, of the Lean Six Sigma and, uh, and uh, uh, management in the US um, uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s. He's, his research showed that 94% of problems in businesses are systems or process driven and only 6% are people driven. Um, and this is very much coming straight from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the lean and the Toyota methodology in, um, in originating in Japan, really, that if you can separate the people from the process, you can take away a lot of the emotion when things go wrong. What we do in a, in a Western culture, when something goes wrong, the first thing we do is trying to find who's to blame, who did that, who was on duty that night, um, instead of trying to say, well, what went wrong with the process that allowed that to happen? There's only two things that Toyota really focus on and that everything that they do boils down to. And they are one of the, they're held in the, in the leading light where it comes to continuous improvement. They invented a lot of the terms that we use today, but they are continuous improvement and complete respect for people, leaving things better than you found them, making sure that you're always thinking about the, the person and then continually improve what you do. Do you remember a few years ago during the World Cup, the Japanese uh, football team left their changing rooms cleaner than they found them. They, they scrubbed their changing rooms and the fans went and cleaned the stadium. You know, amazing um, culture. 
So I'm going to leave you with just this, this uh, uh, statement here. Big journeys begin with small steps. And I suppose the question is, what are you going to do in the next week to improve the process or the service that you're offering this week? Thank you very much.